the disease we're interested in is mastitis. Um, it's an infection of the udder tissue in dairy cows, um, and it's very expensive to the dairy industry. So it results in about $2 billion a year in losses in the U.S., $35 billion worldwide. Uh, when we talk about mastitis, we have to split it into two kinds. There's uh, clinical mastitis. This is where the farmer can look at the udder, see that it's red, it's inflamed, and call in a large animal veterinarian to treat it with small molecule antibiotics. These are actually, there aren't too many cases of these, and because you can identify them, they're very easy to deal with. Uh, the really insidious form of mastitis are subclinical cases. So these are when the cow uh, is infected, but doesn't show any symptoms, and all the same consequences apply. Uh, we believe we know the pathogens that are responsible for mastitis, Staph aureus, E. coli, a few strep species, uh, Uberus, Agalactiae, Dyscalactiae. And uh, the big problem is that these pathogens attack the milk-producing tissue of the udder, so the cows make less milk. Um, and the, 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 the reduction in milk production actually scales with the extent of the infection, and the correlation has been shown and reproduced extensively. Uh, the second big problem is that the milk quality suffers. Uh, it's much less suitable for downstream processes such as cheese making. You can really see the consequences, and A, this is a cup, I wouldn't call it milk anymore, it's more of an exudate, uh, it's a pus, and this comes out of a cow with uh, clinical mastitis, and, and that's why I drink my coffee black. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's about a tablespoon of that in every gallon of milk that you buy at the grocery store. Um, now, it's pasteurized, so it's not going to hurt you, but it's there. Um, what we want to do is use uh, phage therapy uh, to address mastitis. Um, we think it makes a lot of sense. Current uh, treatment strategies with small molecule antibiotics and prevention strategies with iodine sprays are not very effective. Uh, right now, um, cows are sprayed with iodine after milking. Uh, they're milked three times a day, and the, uh, the teat canal stays dilated for about two hours after milking. So that's six hours total where the, the cow is susceptible to an opportunistic pathogen. Uh, but these iodine preventive sprays aren't really doing a good job. Uh, we like this problem for four reasons. Uh, first, the financial impact is substantial. Uh, second, there are very clear metrics for success. So you can measure something called the somatic cell count. It's just the number of the cow's own white blood cells that are shed into the milk. And that gives an indication of the extent of the infection. Uh, the third reason we like it is because the regulatory hurdles uh, are a little bit lower and the challenges to enrolling cows in studies, turns out <laughs> it's much easier, and they can't de-enroll if they don't like the study. And, uh, and finally, we think this problem lends itself very well to a genomics approach. So uh, here's our strategy. Uh, what we do is we partner with dairies around the U.S. Uh, to get raw milk samples. Uh, we take these raw milk samples and we do 16S surveys so we can sequence all the bacteria that are present. Uh, we use these data to inform our, our culturing efforts, basically to tell us which of the milk samples are actually worth culturing and uh, what selective culture conditions to use. Uh, in addition to getting those raw milk samples from the dairies, uh, we also ask for samples of things like farm water runoff, uh, soil, uh, cow manure. Uh, these are very rich sources of phages. We can isolate those phages and we can co-culture them. I feel like I'm falling apart here. We can co-culture them uh, with the isolates from step two. And uh, after several cycles, we can uh, enrich in a winning phage. That is a phage that is uh, uh, highly infectious uh, and or propagates uh, very quickly. Uh, we can take the, the phages uh, back out uh, to the farm, test them in vivo, and then uh, pool them as necessary to get the coverage that we want. Uh, another thing we can do is we can uh, uh, allow uh, 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 resistance to emerge spontaneously in the lab, and we can characterize those resistant variants uh, using whole genome sequencing and RNA-seq, and we can screen the resistant variants against orthogonal phages that will infect them and include those in the original cocktail. We've had a lot of success with that. So I'll briefly show you uh, some data. Um, uh, on the left, uh, you'll see a plate uh, of uh, Staph aureus. This particular staph came from a cow with mastitis. Uh, it's just a lawn of staph. Uh, on the right, you can see we uh, plated it along with phage 53. You can see some phage plaques. Uh, we can pick one of those plaques with an inoculating loop. Uh, we can streak it onto a fresh agar plate, and we can pour staph onto that plate in agar and uh, incubate overnight. Uh, what, what we see this is just a classical uh, streaking experiment. What we see are phage plaques in the form of streaks. We can zoom in and see that those are actually not just lines, but actually new uh, phage plaques. So in this study, uh, now we're switching to E. coli. Uh, I'm showing you growth curves of just BL21 E. coli uh, in black. 
Uh, we can treat that VL21 E. coli uh, with a phage to which it's susceptible, and you can see in gray uh, the, the lysis uh, that occurs. Um, we can co-culture the E. coli and that phage to which it's originally susceptible for long time periods and actually uh, generate resistant strains. So if you look at the red growth curve, you can see a resistant strain. And when we treat that resistant strain with the phage to which it was originally susceptible, shown in green, you see that there's very little change in the growth curve. Uh, so it is, in fact, resistant. Uh, the nice thing is we can take that resistant strain and treat it with a cocktail comprising two additional phages to which it's susceptible, and you can see very good uh, lysis and uh, suppression of resistance um, out to, it's not shown, but out to 20, uh, 20, 20 hours was the last time point that we did, and we hadn't seen a rebound in the growth curve. Uh, we work with uh, the molecular foundry, uh, so for our, our TEM imaging. Uh, you can see in the top left, uh, E. coli only, top middle, these are uh, T7 phage particles. There's no staining here, so you won't see any, any tails. Uh, in the bottom left, we can mix the T7 phages with E. coli uh, for very short time periods, say one or two minutes, and then image, and we see lots of phage docking events. And then in the bottom right, if we wait about 20 minutes, uh, we can image and we see uh, lysis of large numbers of the E. coli cells uh, you can tell from the dark contrast that the cells are dead, and you can see places on the cells, the little white spots where the, uh, where the cell is burst um, open, releasing phages into the environment, using some of the mechanisms that Rai discussed yesterday. So one of the things that we do is we collect a lot of milk samples. It's very important to keep them organized. See, most of them don't actually look like milk samples. They look more like pus or blood. So we, we're definitely getting samples from the right cows. Uh, what we do is we assign a unique uh, identifier to each sample, and we tie that unique identifier to a QR code so we can read all of our samples with a smartphone and get all of the relevant information, uh, including uh, the pathogens that we isolate from those samples and any uh, amplicon or whole genome sequencing data that we obtain. Uh, so here's some recent uh, sequencing data. We sequenced uh, six different raw milk samples, uh, just using 16S. Um, and I'm plotting the percentage of reads from each sample that correspond to these five uh, mastitis-associated pathogens. And one thing that you can see right away is sample three sticks out. It's got a lot of staph aureus, a lot of strep agalactiae. The interesting thing about sample three is that it came from the left rear teat of a cow named Luna. This cow lives on a petting zoo uh, in Cupertino, and you can see our chief medical officer, who's a large animal veterinarian, uh, Dr. Lucia Mokra, is posing in front of Luna. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Mokra has informed the, uh, the petting zoo that their cow was col you know, at least colonized with these bacteria and asked if we could treat with phages. And they said, sure, we love what you're doing. Come treat our cow. Uh, so we've since cultured the Staph aureus, and we're currently screening phages uh, for phages that are effective uh, in vitro in milk. So we'll go out and treat that cow sometime uh, later this month. And now I'll switch to the second part and talk for a few minutes about uh, startup life. So this is where we work. Uh, last year, we were fortunate to be accepted into the inaugural class of the Illumina Accelerator Program. Uh, so with it comes uh, access to uh, Illumina's building. So we work inside of their uh, San Francisco building. Uh, they give us uh, office space uh, with a very nice view of San Francisco. Uh, they give us lab space. You can see we actually have a view of the bay. And uh, they give us $100,000 in sequencing reagents, mentorship from their chief technical officer, Mustafa Ronagi, uh, access to their senior scientists, access to products that actually are not yet commercially available. And we're using some of those. Um, uh, the real gem of the program is access to their sequencing platforms. So we have unlimited uh, use of their uh, MySeq, NextSeq, and HiSeq platforms. So you can see our uh, scientist, Natasha Artsy, and our chief, interim chief technical officer, uh, Dr. Ryan Honecker, posing in front of the MySeq and the NextSeq instruments. So this is an you know, incredibly valuable uh, resource. Uh, we didn't uh, start there. Uh, instead, we, we started here. This is uh, the corner of my living room. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a setup that was perfectly capable of doing uh, DNA extractions and library preps. And we got lots of useful data. Uh, you can see some of you will recognize the PTC100. Uh, this is a thermocycler that Kerry Mullis used to discover PCR. Um, at least it feels like it sometimes. Uh, we then moved to an, uh, an office in, in Oakland, which certainly was not zoned for what we were doing. And then shortly thereafter, uh, moved to our current space that we have uh, in Union City and our Illumina Accelerator space. 
Um, we've been fortunate in that we've gotten some press. So the San Francisco Chronicle wrote an article on us. Uh, Nature covered uh, the Illumina Accelerator uh, uh, program uh, competition. Uh, we were mentioned in Illumina's uh, Q3 earning report from last year. And then Chemical and Engineering News recently wrote an article on phages that you should check out uh, phage companies. Um, and uh, we were mentioned. So along with the, all the publicity, sometimes comes undesirable uh, things. Uh, I consider this a major milestone, but a couple weeks ago we actually received our first cease and desist letter, which <laughs> is always fun. Uh, it appears that the graphic designer uh, that uh, Coriel used to design their logo uh, exercised a little bit too much liberty in recycling the design uh, when he turned around and sold it to us. So now we have to sort that out. In fact, we should probably talk with Anthony uh, after, later uh, about maybe getting a logo that actually has a phage in it. It's not, not the worst thing, right? Um, and uh, to show you a, a quick uh, video clip, this is, this is a lot of fun. Let's see if it plays. Uh, quick time not available. Uh, that's okay. Um, so this, is, uh, this was a, a, a video clip of our CTO, uh, Christina uh, Tsai, uh, working. Uh, you'll notice a few things. One, it's, it's a warehouse space. And I guarantee you the temperature inside is the same as the temperature outside. And you can see it's, it's Christmas Eve. That's another important point, you know, being a startup. It's important to work all the time. And then the one thing that uh, you, you might not be able to tell from the video, uh, or at least the, the picture, is that Christina is nine months pregnant. So two days later, uh, the day after Christmas, she delivered. Uh, so we have uh, we're, uh, recruiting our future scientists already. And then uh, I'll just go through a quick collage uh, in the top left. Where do startups open their bank account? Well, uh, a grocery store. So this is uh, Wells Fargo where we opened our first account inside of the Safeway. Uh, we have our own Tbilisi River uh, in Union City. It turns out it's Alameda Creek, but it's a very rich source of phages. Uh, this is what our board meetings look like. So apparently one of the responsibilities of being on the board of directors is uh, babysitting. Um, uh, it's always fun when you get your logo on the office window for the first time. Uh, this is Dr. Mopez again, our chief medical officer. She's a competitive cyclist and she's riding up Mount Hamilton and along her ride she uh, finds a, a, an escaped calf. She turns out to be a very good calf wrangler. So she's helping a local <laughs> farmer uh, get his calf back to the ranch. Uh, here we are shortly before the Illumin Accelerator program uh, uh, interview. And then here we are in the space, the Illumina space, before it was complete. And here's the director of the Illumina Accelerator, Dr. Amanda Cashin, and the senior scientist, Dr. Courtney McCormick. And uh, here's Luna's baby. So the cow that we're treating on a Cupertino ranch uh, recently had a calf. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our team. Uh, we have a phenomenal team, background in chemistry, molecular biology, uh, physics, microscopy, a bioengineer, a uh, biochemist with a management consulting background, uh, I've already talked about Dr. Mokrez. A lot of the data you saw came from uh, uh, Dr. Hanukkah and, uh, and Natasha Arksey, uh, who's doing uh, our DNA sequencing. And then most uh, recently, we've brought on uh, Anika Kinkabwala, who's doing bioinformatics for us. I apologize for all the affiliations. This is clearly a slide from our uh, VC pitch deck. And uh, most recently, uh, we hired uh, one of uh, Betty Cutter's uh, students, uh, Zach Hobbs, uh, to join us as a technician. And uh, Kyle Schlosser, who also is here and gave a poster, um, uh, will be joining us for an internship this summer. So if you haven't talked to these guys, uh, you should. Uh, raise your hands. Are you here, Zach? Uh, there. So, so talk with these guys and make them uh, explain their research to you. Um, and then finally, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't point out that we are currently raising funding. If, like Rye, you feel like your research isn't really delivering on that economic impact, uh, you can take some money and invest it in Amplify, get the shares for 20, uh, 20 cents a share, or you can invest it uh, in us. Uh, but, you know, consider investing in someone. Uh, and then we're always looking for academic collaborators. For the, next, for the next five months, we have nearly unlimited sequencing resources. We really can't use them uh, fast enough. We'll never use that $100,000 in reagents because the, the, uh, the, fun, you know, the, the loop, uh, uh, the limitation isn't in the, the sequencing itself, it's in all the DNA preps. But if you have libraries that are ready to go, we're more than happy to sequence them uh, so we can talk after. Uh, drop me an email. And if you find any of this interesting, uh, we might also talk about ways to collaborate. Uh, thank you very much for your time.